Here is the answer. Here are the answers. Here's how to get to the answers for the Chemistry One practice quiz, which we will actually have the quiz coming up very soon. So I'm going to explain all the answers here, and I'm hoping I might need a separate sheet of paper to do some of the calculations, but I'm hoping that uh, all of this is clear. I will also just post the answers as they stand on the on the website um, so that people can also just check the answers if they wish. So number one, which of the following indicates the amount of gas particles? Again, not pressure, not volume, not another form of pressure, Tor is another form of pressure. So the only one that it can indicates a number are moles, as we have discussed earlier. Gas pressure is caused by, as I said, we have a container and gas particles hitting and bouncing off the sides and not necessarily losing energy, or if they do lose energy, they regain it from the temperature. That is what causes pressure. So gas molecules hitting the walls of the container. You wouldn't be able to measure it if gas molecules are hitting other gas molecules. There is no reaction and they are not heating up. Uh, so that, well, I mean, if you did heat it up, it would cause a greater pressure, but that's because of the gas molecules hitting the walls of the container more frequently or, or at a higher speed. Gas at a pressure of 608 millimeters of mercury is held in a container with a volume of 440, 545 milliliters. The volume of the container is then increased to 0 0.1, uh, 1065 milliliters without a change in temperature. So temperature is being held constant. <clears throat> I have a P1, I have a V1, I have a V2, and I need to find P2. Now in some cases with ideal gas law you will need to convert units. You don't necessarily need to do that here. So if I just plug in my P1 value, 608, my V1 value, in this case 545 milliliters, equals P2, which I'm trying to solve for, and V2, which is 1065. Divide both sides by 1065. Now again, when I calculate my answer, and I need to get my phone, I will be right back. When I calculate my answer, I will need to think that is my volume increasing? Yes. Should my pressure increase or decrease? It should decrease because you're expanding the volume. You're increasing the amount of space. Therefore, the particles are going to be hitting less frequently. And my dog just walked over here. I'm hoping he doesn't cause any trouble. So I have 608 times 545 divided by 1065. My new pressure, it's basically, I've pretty much doubled my volume, so I should be having my pressure, which is basically what I did. So 311 millimeters of mercury. There's my answer. Let me see where I am as far as position. So now I can probably move up a bit. I'm seeing I'm going to have to plug in my charger alright so to what Celsius temperature must 580 milliliters of oxygen at 17 degrees Celsius be raised to increase its volume to 700 milliliters so in this case I have a volume I have a temperature that's Charles law because pressure is being held constant here so I have Celsius temperature. I will need to go back to Celsius temperature, but in the meantime, I always need to convert to Kelvin. So 17 Celsius plus 273 is going to give me 290 Kelvin. Now, V1 is 580 over... T1 
290 equals 700 over x. Here I can cross multiply. 580x equals 290 times 700 is 203 thousand divided by 580 divide by 580 I look back what am I solving for I'm solving for the second temperature although this temperature will be given to me in Kelvin so 350 Kelvin is the temperature but it's asking for Celsius so if I pick this answer I'm wrong what I need to do is 350, now I'm going from Kelvin back to Celsius. Instead of adding 273, I need to subtract 273, and that gives me 77 degrees Celsius. All right, slight readjustment to get my power cable. I finished at number four. Gas pressure at 765 torr at 25 degrees, 23 degrees Celsius. At what temperature will the pressure be 300, 560 torr? Now this is a... Guy Lussac's law problem. First thing I have to do, of course, is convert Celsius to Kelvin. So 273 plus 23 is going to give me 296 Kelvin. And now I'm going to solve for temperature. When it spits out a temperature, when I use Guy Lussac's law, I will end up getting a temperature in Kelvin as well. Nicely, thankfully, it's asking for a temperature in Kelvin. So, P1, 760, whoops, 765 torr, which is slightly above normal atmospheric pressure. 765 over my T1, which is 296, equals 560 over... T2. Now understand, in this particular case, my temperature should be lower. If my pressure drops, my te I'm sorry, if my, if my pressure drops, my temperature drops. Or if my temperature drops, my pressure drops. Because again, the ga gas molecules are hitting each other. When you slow them down, they hit the sides less, and they end up um, producing less pressure. So I, again, cross multiply. 765 T2 equals... 560 times 296, whoops, 560 times 296, which is 165, 165,760 divided by 765, T2 equals 216. So again, temperature did go down, although that is not one of my possible answers. So let's take a look at that again. I have 765. I have 23 plus 273, 296. equals 560 P2 over, we'll just call it X this time. Let's try this again. So, 765 X equals 296 times 560, 165,760 divided by 7, 65, that's 216. I don't see the answer there. That's the temperature in Kelvin. That must be a typo. It should be 216K. So, mistakes happen. These questions I got from a variety of sources. Obviously, not everyone checks their answers very well. So 765. So there must have been a typo here. It should be 216K instead of 226K.
I don't know what else I can do. Actually, and, and technically it was rounding up, we got to do 217. Okay, we don't have that option. All right, a gas occupies 7.8 cubic centimeters at 71.8 kilopascals and 25 degrees Celsius. What is the volume at STP? This is one I think I'm going to have to move to a separate sheet of paper just so I can show the calculation. So I have a P1, which is 71.8 kilopascals. I have a T1, which is 25 degrees Celsius. So 25 plus 273 equals 2. 98. I have a V1, 7.84, e, 1 cubic centimeter is the same as 1 milliliter. It doesn't really matter. Either one I can use. So I have a P1, T1, V1. I have a P2 and I have a T2 because pressure, it says at STP, standard pressure is 1 atmosphere or 101.3 kilopascals. T2 is going to be STP, 0 degrees Celsius, that's 273K. So now I have a combined gas law problem, which means P1, 71.8, V1, 7.84, over T1, which is 298, equals P2, 101.3. I'm keeping my units consistent. Kilopascals and kilopascals. That is essential. V2 is what I'm solving for. And then T2 is 273. Alright, so 71.8 times 7.84 equals 562 divided by 298 is 1, ah, uh, we're going to start this again, uh, one point eight we'll call it 1.889, and then 101.3, x over 273, so I multiply both sides by 273, that gives me 515.69 equals 101.3, x divided by 101.3, divided by 101.3, x equals... Ah, uh, 515.69 divided by 101.3 is 5.09 mLs. Now again, think, I've increased my pressure and I've lowered my temperature. Both of those things are going to cause my volume to decrease. So that actually makes sense. Now in this case, do I have the answer? Yes, I do. Thank goodness we have confirmed. Milliliters are the same thing as cubic centimeters as we've established. Okay. If the volume of a confined gas, this is number seven, if the volume of a confined gas is doubled while the temperature remains constant, what change would be observed in the pressure? So we're doubling the volume. We're increasing it by two and we're seeing about the pressure so could I set this up this is Boyle's law let's say I had a pressure of one atmosphere let's say I had a volume of one liter and then my pressure two I don't know my V2 is two now I've doubled it divides both sides by two and X equals one half the pressure would be half as large. The answer is letter A. All right. A sample of nitrogen occupies 5.50 liters under a pressure of 900 torr at 25 degrees Celsius. At what temperature will it occupy 10 liters at the same pressure? 
So we're keeping pressure constant. We're changing temperature. This is a Charles Law problem. So V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. 5.5 liters over 25 degrees Celsius. So 25 plus 273 is 298. We always have to convert temperature to Kelvin. At what temperature will it occupy 10 liters? At the same pressure, but it's a different temperature. Again, now I can cross multiply. 5.5x equals 10 times 298, which is 2980, divided by 5.5, divided by 5.5. And I get 541 degrees Kelvin. 541, we'll call it 542 Kelvin. In order to go from Kelvin back to Celsius, I have to subtract 273. And I end up getting 268.8, which is 269, there is my answer in degrees Celsius. And again, does this make sense? I raise the temperature, I have to raise the temperature in order to increase the volume. That's exactly what uh, Charles Law says, the temperature and volume are directly proportional. If I raise the temperature, I, raise, I increase the volume. If I decrease the temperature, I decrease the volume. It's a direct relationship. All right, now let me flip the page over and hope that I can fit everything properly. A little bit down, a little bit farther. All right, there we go. A sample of oxygen occupies 47.2 liters under a pressure of 1,240 torr at 25 degrees Celsius. What at what volume would it occupy at 25 degrees Celsius if the pressure were decreased to 730 torr? So we're keeping pressure constant again. We don't have to worry about pressure. This is, I'm sorry. We're keeping temperature constant. We have to worry about pressure. I'm sorry, I'm confusing myself. Once I start looking at this, it'll make sense. So I do have a P1, which is 1,240 torr. I have a V1 which is 47.2 liters. I have a P2, which is 730 torr, and it's asking for the V2. Again, I'm just plugging in numbers. I do not have to convert torr into anything else. As long as my units are consistent, I'm good. Now, might there be a situation where you have to convert um, Pressures in a Charles Law or Boyle's Law or Guy Lussac's or Combined Gas Law? Yes, if these were different units, you would have to convert one. Ideal Gas Law, we want to turn all of our units into kilopascals, but we're not doing an Ideal Gas Law so much yet. So my P1 is 1,240. My V1 is 47.2. My P2 is 730. And my V2, I don't know. Divide both sides by 730, and I end up having here 1,240 times 47.2 equals, divided by 730, is 80. So my, my volume will be, my new volume will be 80. 0.17 or 80.2 liters. Now, does that make sense? I'm keeping the pressure, I'm sorry, I'm keeping the temperature constant. I'm decreasing the pressure. That means I need to increase the volume in order for that to happen. So there we go. All right. Density of chlorine gas at STP in grams per liter. So any gas the magic number at STP, any gas occupies 22.4 liters. 
the density of chlorine gas, remember chlorine gas is Cl2, one mole of chlorine gas occupies 22.4 liters. So one mole of chlorine gas is the molar mass, which is 35.5 times two, because it's two chlorines in each molecule. So the, the molar mass is 71.0 grams. That occupies a space of 22.4 liters because one mole of any gas occupies that volume. So my grams divided by my liters, I have 71 divided by 22.4, which equals 3.17 approximately, which would be the same thing as 3.2 grams per cubic centimeter. I'm sorry, that's per cubic centimeter. There's something wrong here. That's grams per liter. They have the incorrect units on this. I apologize. Um, cubic decimeter would be a liter. Again, this is what happens when you get problems, multiple choice problems, uh, off the internet. Sometimes they are not very good. So cubic decimeter would be a liter, or we just put a liter, but that is actually slightly incorrect. I'll have to make a note that it should be 3.2 grams per liter, not grams per cubic centimeter. If we're grams per cubic centimeter, that means it's denser than water, which means the chlorine gas would sink in water, and that's not, not the case. All right, which one of the following statements, let me see if I can still fit this. This is the last one I can fit before I move. Which one of the following statements is not consistent with the kinetic molecular theory of gases? Well, we do know that individual gas molecules are far apart. That's why we can squeeze gases. The actual volume of the gas molecules themselves is very small compared to the volume occupied by the gas. We also know that because we can squeeze them down. There's very little space in uh, the, the, the size of the, the molecule of the atom itself is very small. The average kinetic energies of different gases are different at the same temperature. No, the average kinetic energy has to be the same, so that's probably the correct answer. There is no net gain or loss of total kinetic energy in collisions. Remember, the, as the gas molecules hit the sides, they keep hitting the sides with the same force, so the pressure remains consistent. So that is actually true. There's no net gain or loss. The theory explains most of the observed behavior of gases. Well, of course it does. So the answer for this one is letter, whoa, is letter C. The average kinetic energy of different gases are different at the same temperature. All right, now we're going to move up. These are another couple of good problems. I just need to make sure they fit. All right, so. This you have to absolutely be prepared for. 123 degrees Celsius, I add 273 in order to get my Kelvin. That gives me 396K, letter is A. We have to be prepared for that. When a supply of hydrogen gas is held in a four liter container at 320K, it exerts a pressure of 800 torr. The supply is moved to a two liter container and cooled to 160K. What is the new pressure of the combined gas? So what do I have here? I have a volume, I have a temperature, and I have a pressure. That's a P1, V1, and a T1. I have a V2, I have a T2, and it's asking me for a P2. This is combined gas law. So now I just have to plug in my numbers. I have four liters, I'm sorry, I have 800 torr, that's my P1. 800 torr, V1 is four liters, T1 is 320K. That equals, now I have the P2, which I don't know if I want to call that X, I can. Do I have a V2? Yes, I'm at 2 liters, and I have a T2, 160K. 
So first I can do everything on the left side here, 800 times 4 divided by 320 equals 10. 10 equals 2x over 160. Multiply both sides by 160. That gives me 1600. 2x divided by 2 divided by 2. x equals 8. 800. 800 tor Yeah, is number one. All right. So in this case, I ended up reducing the size and reducing the temperature. Reducing the size should have increased the pressure, but reducing the temperature lowered the pressure, and therefore, that is my answer. Now, could I do this in a slightly different fashion? I could actually do a calculation from Guy Lussac's law. Let's see if that would give me the same answer. So let's say I just have a pressure and a temperature. Okay, so I go from 800 over um, 1, I'm sorry, 320 equals P2 over T2, which is now 160. Now this is assuming that I keep the volume consistent, which I'm not actually doing, but if I did 800 divided by 320, I get 2.5, and then I multiply 2.5 by 160, I get 400. So my P2 in this case would be 400 tor. Now what did I do if I forget about that now and I look at my pressure, I'm sorry, if I look at my volume, I'm taking a Boyle's Law problem now. So what happens here? I do a P1 which is 800 and a V1 which is 4 and I go to a P2, which is X, and a V2, which is 2. And now I get 800 1600. That gives me my number here. So that means that if I am increasing if I'm increasing the, I'm sorry, if I'm decreasing the volume by a factor of two in this case, right? I'm increasing the, vol the pressure. If I'm decreasing the temperature, I'm decreasing the pressure. So here I would get 1600, here I would get 400. And the factor, I'm multiplying this, I'm, I'm quadrupling this, I'm having this. And what I end up doing is keeping the pressure constant. Um, that's just another way of looking at it. It's a lot of complicated stuff. Really just use the, the combined gas law and you'll be fine. All right, let me get to the next page. All right, slight readjustment to get my power cable. I finished at number four. Gas pressure at 765 torr at 25 degrees, 23 degrees Celsius. At what temperature will the pressure be 560 torr? Now this is a Guy Lussac's law problem. First thing I have to do, of course, is convert Celsius to Kelvin. So 273 plus 23 is going to give me 296 Kelvin. And now I'm going to solve for temperature. When it spits out a temperature, when I use Guy Lussac's law, I will end up getting a temperature in Kelvin as well. Nicely, thankfully, it's asking for a temperature in Kelvin. So, P1, 760, whoops, 765 torr, which is slightly above normal atmospheric pressure. 
765 over my T1, which is 296, equals 560 over T2. Now understand, in this particular case, my temperature should be lower. If my pressure drops, my I'm sorry, if my, if my pressure drops, my temperature drops. Or if my temperature drops, my pressure drops. Because again, the ga gas molecules are hitting each other when you slow them down. They hit the sides less and they end up um, producing less pressure. So I, again, cross multiply. 765T2 equals 560 times 296. Whoops. 560 times 296, which is 165, 165,760 divided by 765, T2 equals 216. So again, temperature did go down, although that is not one of my possible answers. So let's take a look at that again. I have 765. I have 23 plus 273, 296 equals 560 P2 over, we'll just call it X this time. Let's try this again. So 765 X equals 296 times 560, 165,760 divided by 765, that's 216. I don't see the answer there. That's the temperature in Kelvin. That must be a typo. It should be 216. Okay, so mistakes happen. These questions I got from a variety of sources. Obviously, not everyone checks their answers very well. So, 765. So, there must have been a typo here. It should be 216K instead of 226K. I don't know what else I can do. Actually, and, and technically, it was. Rounding up, we've got to do 217. Okay, we don't have that option. All right. A gas occupies 7.8 cubic centimeters at 71.8 kilopascals and 25 degrees Celsius. What is the volume at STP? This is one I think I'm going to have to move to a separate sheet of paper just so I can show the calculation. So I have a P1, which is... 71.8 kilopascals. I have a T1, which is 25 degrees Celsius. So 25 plus 273 equals 298. I have a V1, 7.84. Eat one cubic centimeter is the same as one milliliter. It doesn't really matter. Either one I can use. So I have a P1, T1, V1. I have a P2 and I have a T2 because pressure, it says at STP, standard pressure is one atmosphere or 101.3 kilopascals. T2 is going to be STP, zero degrees Celsius. That's 273K. So now I have a combined gas law problem, which means... P1, 71.8, V1, 7.84, over T1, which is 298, equals P2, 101.3. I'm keeping my units consistent, kilopascals and kilopascals. That is essential. V2 is what I'm solving for, and then T2 is 273. All right, so... 
times 7.84 equals 562 divided by 298 is 1. Ah, uh, we're going to start this again. Uh, One point eight 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 nine. We'll call it one point eight eight nine. And then one point one oh one point three X over two seventy three. So I multiply both sides by two seventy three. That gives me five hundred fifteen. Point six nine equals one oh one point three x divided by one oh one point three divided by one oh one point three x equals ah, five fifteen point six nine divided by one oh one point three is five point zero nine. MLs. Now again, think, I've increased my pressure and I've lowered my temperature. Both of those things are going to cause my volume to decrease. So that actually makes sense. Now in this case, do I have the answer? Yes, I do. Thank goodness we have confirmed. Milliliters are the same thing as cubic centimeters as we've established. Okay. If the volume of a confined gas, this is number seven, if the volume of a confined gas is doubled, while the temperature remains constant, what change would be observed in the pressure? So we're doubling the volume. We're increasing it by two. And we're seeing about the pressure. So could I set this up? This is Boyle's Law. Let's say I had a pressure of one atmosphere. Let's say I had a volume of one liter. And then my pressure 2, I don't know. My V2 is 2 now. I've doubled it. Divide both sides by 2 and X equals 1 half. The pressure would be half as large. The answer is letter A. All right. A sample of nitrogen occupies 5.50 liters under a pressure of 900 torr at 25 degrees Celsius. At what temperature will it occupy 10 liters at the same pressure. So we're keeping pressure constant. We're changing temperature. This is a Charles Law problem. So V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. 5.5 liters over 25 degrees Celsius. So 25 plus 273 is 298. We always have to convert temperature to Kelvin. At what temperature will it occupy 10 liters at the same pressure, but it's a different temperature? Again, now I can cross multiply. 5.5x equals 10 times 298, which is 2,980. Divided by 5.5, divide by 5.5, and I get 541 degrees Kelvin. 541, we'll call it 542 Kelvin. In order to go from Kelvin back to Celsius, I have to subtract 273 and I end up getting 268.8, which is 269. There is my answer in degrees Celsius. And again, does this make sense? I raise the temperature. I have to raise the temperature in order to increase the volume. That's exactly what uh, Charles Law says, that temperature and volume are directly proportional. If I raise the temperature, I, raise, I increase the volume. If I decrease the temperature, I decrease the volume. It's a direct relationship. All right, now let me flip the page over and hope that I can fit everything properly.
a little bit down a little bit farther. All right, there we go. A sample of oxygen occupies 47.2 liters under a pressure of 1,240 torr at 25 degrees Celsius. What, at what volume would it occupy at 25 degrees Celsius if the pressure were decreased to 730 torr? So we're keeping pressure constant again. We don't have to worry about pressure. This is, I'm sorry. We're keeping temperature constant. We have to worry about pressure. I'm sorry, I'm confusing myself. Once I start looking at this, it'll make sense. So I do have a P1, which is 1,240 torr. I have a V1, which is 47.2 liters. I have a P2, which is 730 torr. And it's asking for the V2. Again, I'm just plugging in numbers. I do not have to convert tour into anything else. As long as my units are consistent, I'm good. Now, might there be a situation where you have to convert um, pressures in a Charles Law or Boyle's Law or Guy Lussac's or Combined Gas Law? Yes, if these were different units, you would have to convert one. Ideal Gas Law, we want to turn all of our units into kilopascals, but we're not doing an Ideal Gas Law so much yet. So my P1 is 1,240. My V1 is 47.2. My P2 is 730. And my V2, I don't know. Divide both sides by 730. And I end up having here 1,240 times 47.2 equals divided by 730 is 80. So my my volume will be my new volume will be 80.17 or 80.2 liters. Now does that make sense? I'm keeping the pressure, I'm sorry, I'm keeping the temperature constant. I'm decreasing the pressure. That means I need to increase the volume in order for that to happen. So there we go. All right. Density of chlorine gas at STP in grams per liter. So any gas, the magic number at STP, any gas occupies 22.4 liters. The density of chlorine gas, remember chlorine gas is Cl2. One mole of chlorine gas occupies 22.4 liters. So one mole of chlorine gas is the molar mass, which is 35.5 times two, because it's two chlorines in each molecule. So the, the molar mass is 71.0 grams. That occupies a space of 22.4 liters because one mole of any gas occupies that volume. So my grams divided by my liters, I have 71 divided by 22.4, which equals 3.17 approximately, which would be the same thing as 3.2 grams per cubic centimeter. I'm sorry, that's per cubic centimeter. There's something wrong here. That's grams per liter. They have the incorrect units on this. I apologize. Um, cubic decimeter would be a liter. Again, this is what happens when you get problems, multiple choice problems uh, off the internet. Sometimes they are not very good. So cubic decimeter would be a liter, or we just put a liter, but that is actually slightly incorrect. I'll have to make a note that it should be 3.2 grams per liter, not grams per cubic centimeter. If we're grams per cubic centimeter, that means it's denser than water, which means that chlorine gas would sink in water, and that's not, not the case. All right, which one of the following statements, let me see if I can still fit this. This is the last one I can fit before I move. Which one of the following statements is not consistent with the kinetic molecular theory of gases? Well, we do know that individual gas molecules are far apart. That's why we can squeeze 
gases. The actual volume of the gas molecules themselves is very small compared to the volume occupied by the gas. We also know that because we can squeeze them down. There's very little space. In, uh, the, the, the size of the, the molecule, the atom itself, is very small. The average kinetic energies of different gases are different at the same temperature. No, the average kinetic energy has to be the same, so that's probably the correct answer. There is no net gain or loss of total kinetic energy in collisions. Remember, the, as the gas molecules hit the sides, they keep hitting the sides with the same force, so the pressure remains consistent. So that is actually true. There's no net gain or loss. The theory explains most of the observed behavior of gases. Well, of course it does. So the answer for this one is letter, whoa, is letter C. The average kinetic energy of different gases are different at the same temperature. All right, now we're going to move up. These are another couple of good problems. I just need to make sure they fit. All right, so this you have to absolutely be prepared for. 123 degrees Celsius, I add 273 in order to get my Kelvin. That gives me 396K, letter is A. We have to be prepared for that. When a supply of hydrogen gas is held in a four liter container at 320K, it exerts a pressure of 800 torr. The supply is moved to a two liter container and cooled to 160K. What is the new pressure of the combined gas? So what do I have here? I have a volume, I have a temperature, and I have a pressure. That's a P1, V1, and a T1. I have a V2, I have a T2, and it's asking me for a P2. This is combined gas law. So now I just have to plug in my numbers. I have four liters, I'm sorry, I have 800 torr, that's my P1. 800 torr, V1 is four liters, T1 is 320K. That equals, now I have the P2, which I don't know if I want to call that X, I can. Do I have a V2? Yes, I'm at 2 liters, and I have a T2, 160K. So first I can do everything on the left side here. 800 times 4 divided by 320 equals 10. 10 equals 2X over 160. Multiply both sides by 160. That gives me 1600. 2x divided by 2 divided by 2. x equals 8. 800. 800 tor. Yeah, is number one. All right, here we are on page, the second page of the Chemistry 1 practice exam. Each of these flasks contains the same number of gas molecules. Okay, so same number of moles. In which would the pressure be the lowest? This is, we're keeping number of moles constant, we're keeping the volume constant, so it's really dependent on temperature. Which has the lowest temperature? Flask 1, the pressure would be the lowest in flask 1. A small sample, number 15, a small sample of helium gas occupies 6 milliliters at a temperature of 250K. At what temperature does the volume expand to 9 milliliters? This is Charles' law, so V1 over T1. What I'm plugging in here, if I plug in milliliters, I'm going to get out milliliters, just to keep consistent with units. Could I convert this to liters, 0 0.006? Sure. Do I need to? Not necessarily. And then I'm going to go 9 milliliters. This is going to give me a temperature in Kelvin. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. So now I do 6 divided by 250, which is 0 0.024, equals 9 over X. If I multiplied by both sides by 
x, 0.024x equals 9 divided by 0 0.024 divided by 0 0.024, 9 divided by 0 0.024 equals 375. Does that make sense? I have to raise my temperature in order to increase my volume as Charles, I'm sorry, yeah, as Charles Law would state. So that makes perfect sense. If I increase the temperature, I increase the volume. Why is a gas easier to compress than a liquid or a solid? This is related to kinetic molecular theory. And the reason is the space between gas particles much less, I'm sorry. This, no. So volume increases more under, no. Um, volume increases, no, that's also not true. The space between gas particles is much less, no, that's actually also not true, my mistake. The volume of a gas particle is small compared to the overall volume of the gas. When you're talking about a liquid or a solid, the particles are right up there next to each other and their volume does count. It does not matter in the case of a gas, at least under most conditions. All right. Moving up to 1617. I'm sorry, 1718 and 19. There we go. We can fit them all on. Why does the pressure inside a container of gas increase if more gas is added? This is Avogadro's law. We have a container, V1 over N1, which is the number of moles, equals V2 over N2. Why does the pressure inside of a container of gas increase if more gas is added to the container? There is an increase in the number of collisions between particles on the walls of the container is absolutely true. We're keeping temperature constant. Would there be an increase in temperature? Not necessarily. Is there a decrease in the volume? Absolutely not. Is there an increase in the force of collisions? No, because we're also not doing anything with temperature. So there is an increase in the number of collisions between particles on the walls of the container. Letter A would be the answer. A sample of gas occupies 17 milliliters at negative 112 degrees Celsius. What volume does the sample occupy at 70 degrees Celsius? This is another uh, Charles Law problem. I have 17 over. Now here's where I have to be careful. To go from Celsius to Kelvin, I have to add 273. So 112, negative 112 plus 273 is 161 Kelvin. This is why I need, if I left this as a Celsius temperature, I'd end up getting a negative volume, which does not make any sense. X over now 70 plus 273 is 343. Cross multiply 161X equals 343 times 17, which is 5,831 divided by 161 divided by 161. This is going to give me my second volume, which is 36.2, letter B, thereabouts. Okay. Dalton's law of partial pressures. This is the last one we have to worry about right now. We have to do Boyle's law, Charles' law, Guy Lussac's law. Combined gas law and Dalton's law of partial pressures it says that individual gases exert different pressures independently of each other when combined in a container because they do not interact with each other. Total pressure, P1, P2, P3. A mixture of oxygen, carbon dioxide, and nitrogen has a total pressure of 98.26 kilopascals. What is the partial pressure of oxygen if the partial pressure of nitrogen is 91 millimeters of mercury different units? And the partial pressure of carbon dioxide is tore different units again. I must convert everything to a consistent number of units. So, what is my conversion? 91.2 millimeters of mercury times 101.3 kilopascals over 760 millimeters of mercury. We're canceling out units as we always do. This is equivalent to one atmosphere. That is also equivalent to one atmosphere. So I get 91.2 times 101.3 divided by 
760 is 12.15 kilopascals. We'll call it 12.16 kilopascals. That is the pressure of nitrogen. And then the pressure of carbon dioxide, 532 torr, same idea, 101.3 kilopascals. Now millimeters of mercury is the same thing as torr, named after Torricelli who invented the barometer. My torr cancel out, I end up getting 532 times 101.3 divided by 760 is 70.91 kilopascals. My total pressure is 98.26. So if my total pressure is 98.26 and I want to find, I know the pressure of nitrogen and I know the pressure of carbon dioxide, then in order to find the pressure of oxygen, I just need to subtract from the total these two pressures and I'll get my pressure for oxygen. So my total pressure is 98.26. I subtract out my 70.91. And that is 27. That's after I've removed the pressure for carbon dioxide. Now I have to remove the pressure for nitrogen, 27.35 minus 12.16, which is 15.19 kilopascals. I don't see the answer there because the answer is actually in atmospheres. Could I have also converted everything into atmospheres? Absolutely. I just like to get in the habit of transferring everything to kilopascals because that's going to be extremely important when we do ideal gas law. So, one atmosphere over 101.3 kilopascals, that means these units cancel out. 15.19 divided by 101.3 is 0 0.15 atmospheres. All right. Let me line up the other side here. To get to number 20. All right, number 20. Hospital patients are administered oxygen from a pressurized hyperbaric oxygen chamber. This is important in medicine. I just ran out of lead. Graphite, ah, come on. Let me get another pencil real quick. Ah, that one's also out. You know what, I'm just gonna switch to a pen. If I make a mistake, I make a mistake. We'll just deal with it, okay. Hospital patients, Mr. Hyperbaric Oxygen Chamber. So actually my dad had a lot of extensive surgeries. He needed to be in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber, which increases the oxygen uh, in your bloodstream because of the pressure. 600 liters of oxygen is compressed in a cylinder at 160 atmospheres. What volume of oxygen can a cylinder supply at a pressure of three atmospheres? So, this is Boyle's law. P1, V1 equals P2, V2. P1 is 160 atmospheres. V1 is 600 liters. P2 is three atmospheres. And then V2 is what we're trying to find. All I need to do is divide both sides by three and I get my volume, which would be in liters because I plugged in liters for the other one. 160 times 600 divided by three is 3,200 liters, which is improper scientific notation. That is the answer. It should be 3.2 times 10 to the fourth liters if we're putting this in proper scientific notation. Really leads me to question um, some of these websites that I'm getting the problems from, or maybe I should just be questioning myself for pulling off of these websites. Anyway, 
Volume of a sample of helium is 4.5 milliliters at 20 degrees Celsius and 203 kilopascals. What will its volume be in the figure? This looks like I have a volume, temperature, pressure. Temperature, pressure. And it's asking for volume. This is a combined gas law problem. My P1 is 203 kilopascals. My V1 is 4.5 milliliters. Now I'm going to get my volume again in milliliters if that's what I plug in. This I need to convert to Kelvin. 20 degrees Celsius plus 273 is 293. Now I'm at 10 degrees Celsius and 203. So actually, you know what? Pressure remains constant. I could have just done Charles Law here. And then I have a V2, which I'll designate as X. And then I have a 283 degrees Celsius, I'm sorry, degrees Kelvin, because I'm at 10 degrees Celsius. So for my degrees Celsius to Kelvin, I add 273. All right. Well, I can show you that I can actually get either answer. So 203 times 4.5 divided by 293 is 3.118, we'll call it, equals 203.0x over 283. So multiply this by 283, I get 8.8. 2.3 equals 203.0x, divide by 203.0, divide by 203.0, 4.3. Now again, my x equals 4.34 milliliters in this case. Does that make sense? I have a constant pressure and I've lowered the temperature. If I lower the temperature, it will shrink. Now, I did this with combined gas law. Could I also do it with Charles law? Let's see. So my V1 is 4.5. My T1 is 293. My V2 I don't know and my T2 is 283. Cross multiply 293x equals 4.5 times 283 and then divide both sides by 293 and I should get the same answer. And I do, 4.34 milliliters. All right, I think I need to move up my paper a bit. A little bit more, and we're good to go again. At an open ocean depth, this is number 22, at an ocean depth of 10 meters, a diver's lung capacity is 2.4 liters. The air temperature is 32 degrees Celsius, and the pressure is 101.3 kilopascals. That's actually not accurate at 10 meters. You'd have a lot more pressure than that, but we'll just do this problem. What is the volume of the diver's lungs at the same depth at a temperature of 21 degrees Celsius and a pressure of 141.20 kilopascals? So at an ocean depth, this is, now we have combined gas law. Does anything change? Pressure changes, temperature changes, and volume's going to change. So this is combined gas law. My P1, 101.3. My V1, 2. Point four. My T1 is 32 degrees Celsius. So 32 plus 273 is 5305. My P2, 141.2. My V2 is what I'm trying to find. And my T2 is now 273 plus 21, that's 294. All right, so, as we've been doing, 101.3 times 
divided by 305, 0 0.797 equals this, so I actually need to multiply both sides by 294, and then that would equal 141.2x. So multiply this by 294, 234, point three five equals one forty one point two x divide by one forty one point two divide by one forty one point two my answer is one point six five nine or one point six six liters now does that make sense i'm increasing the pressure I'm decreasing the temperature. Both of those things should also decrease the volume, which is actually what happens. So that absolutely makes sense. Number 23, gas is combined in a metal tank in the figure. At 20.20 degrees Celsius, the gas exerts a pressure of 8.532 atmospheres. After heating the tank, the pressure of the gas increases to 1.406 atmospheres. What is the temperature of the heated gas? This is Guy Lussac's law. What's my first pressure? 8.53 atmospheres. What's my temperature? 20.20. Add that to 273, and I get 293.20. My P1, my T1 in Kelvin, because that's required. I can't do it in Celsius. Now I'm heating the tank. The pressure has gone up. 10.406, and my T2 is what I'm solving for. I cross multiply, 8.53x equals 293.2 times 10.406. So this is 3051 divided by 8.5. 3 divided by 8.53 and I get 357k. I solved for T2. 357k. Does that make sense? Is that higher than my original temperature? Yes. If temperature goes up, pressure should go up. That's exactly what happened. Now I need to convert this back into Celsius. So instead of going from Celsius to Kelvin where I add 273, I need to subtract 273, and I get 15, 8, uh, 84 degrees Celsius. That would be my answer is letter C. Double checking my answer with the calculator. Okay. What quantity of gas in moles is contained in 22.21 liters at STP? Well, I know my liters. Convert to moles. This is one of those magic numbers you need to know and you cannot forget, especially for the final. Now my um, liters cancel out and I get 2.21 divided by 22.4, which equals 0 0.9, ah, I'm sorry, 0 0.09866071. So which number is closest to that? Letter B, that's my answer. All right, that concludes page two. I need to go find page three, so hold on one moment. All right, the next page is our Exposure, not our first exposure, but an exposure to ideal gas law, um, which is the PV was NRT. This will be included on our test. In fact, most of our tests will include the ideal gas law because that is the most important of all the gas laws that we're learning. Now, challenge with this is the ideal gas constant. If I want to use 8.31, my units are kilopascal liters over moles degrees 
Kelvin, which means I'm going to need to convert my atmospheres into kilo kilopascals, and I'm going to need to turn my temperature into Kelvin, which I always need to do. Uh, my volume is already in liters, so what do I need to do? My pressure is 4.972 atmospheres. To turn that to kilopascals, 101.3 kilopascals over one atmosphere. Same thing, we're canceling out what we don't want, we're keeping what we want. So 4.972 times 101.3 is 503.67 we'll call that kilopascals. My temperature is 31.8. I need to add 273 to that. Technically 273.15, but that's not that big of a deal. Um, so this would be now four, so 304.8 Kelvin. Whoops. And now I'm gonna plug these things in. So my P, 503.67. My V is 9.583. My N is what I'm trying to find. My R, since I have kilopascals and I have liters, I can use R as 8.31. And my T, 304.8. All right, so 8.31 times 304.8 equals, that seems like an awfully high number, 8.31 times 304.8 equals, there we go, let me just try that one more time, 8.31 times 304.8 that looks good. All right, so divide this side by 2,533. We'll call that, divide this side by 2,533 and equals. So now it would be 503.67 times 9.538. 583, I'm sorry, divided by 2,533. My number of moles is 1.90 or 1.91 moles, which I have right there, 1.90, 1.91. Either way, we're close enough we can find the right answer. All right. Now, liquid traveling up a straw, just like the crushing can, either one of those you might have on the quiz that will be given. So in the case of the straw, I have my liquid, I have my straw. If you remove air from inside this straw, you're decreasing the pressure in here. You're decreasing, you're, I'm sorry, you're decreasing the volume, you're decreasing the pressure uh, because you're removing molecules of air. What happens then is the air pressure on the outside pushes down on the surface of your liquid and pushes the liquid up the straw uh, to replace that area where you have removed the gas and removed the pressure. So high pressure will always push against low pressure. It's exactly kind of the same idea as the can. You heat up the can, you actually get water vapor in here which is at the same pressure as long as the gas can escape to the outside. Air pressure inside is equal to air pressure on the outside. When you flip this can over into the water, two things happen. One, the gas cools down, so your water vapor starts to condense, removing the gas. Um, so the gas starts to condense back into water, and the air pressure on the outside is now going to push so hard that the can itself gets crushed. So those are two examples of practical uses or practical observations for gas pressure. Now I'm going to stop this video to get to the review section. This covers all of the gas law material which will be on the quiz. Alright, now these problems which I also placed on 
the practice quiz are ideas that we can't be forgetting as we move forward. Uh, these could m most definitely be on a final exam, so I want to make sure that we do not forget these particular concepts. A student determined the density of a solid to be 2.90, 2.91, and 2.93. These numbers are very close to each other, so they're very precise. But the actual volume is 2.70, so it's not very accurate. He may have measured or she may have measured a lot of different measurements very close to each other, but they were not very precise. So we have high precision and low accuracy. Letter B. A student is asked to measure 30 grams of methanol. The density is 0 0.7914 grams per milliliter, but has only a graduated cylinder with which to measure it. What volume of the methanol? So density is mass over volume. In this case, density is 0 0.7914. Mass is 30 grams over the volume. So if I multiply both sides by V to get this on top, I get 0 0.7914 V equals 30.0. Divide by 0 0.7914, divide by 0 0.7914. My volume is now, let me get my, so 30 divided by, 0.7914 is 37.9 milliliters, which is letter D. There's my answer. All right, let me see if I have to move up a bit. I should. Got more. Now I have to move down. Okay. Which compound contains the highest percentage of nitrogen by mass? So it's basically the mass of the nitrogen divided by the total molar mass. So in this particular case, nitrogen is 14, nitrogen, hydrogen is 2, oxygen is 16. So this is 14 plus 16 is 30, 30 plus, so that's 33 grams per mole. Out of that 33, 14 grams are nitrogen. So I have 14 divided by 33 is 0 0.42. If I multiply that by 100, that's 42% um, nitrogen out of the total. And the next one, ammonium nitrite. Now I have two nitrogens, that's 28. 28 plus two oxygens. My dog, I'm sorry. Rocky, hey, knock it off. All right, so 28, and then I have two times 16, which is 32. 32 plus 28 is 60, and then I have one, two, three, four, so that ends up being 64. So my total mass, 64 grams. How much of it came from nitrogen? 28. 28 divided by 64. So my number percent, my amount of nitrogen divided by my total times 100. That gives me 43, almost 44 percent. In this case, I have two nitrogens again. 14 times 2 is 28. And I have three oxygen, so that's 48. 16 times 3 is 48. So 28 plus 48, my total is 76. 28 divided by 76, my total is 36 point, or 3, 0.368, which if I multiply it by 100 is 36.8%, which again is lower. And then I can already tell here, this is 24. This is 32. Now I'm adding 12 to it. So my total molar mass here is going to be 28 plus 4 plus, so 28 plus 6 
is 34. 34 plus 12 is 46. And then 46 plus 32 for the two oxygens is 78. So I can already tell without having to do the calculation. I still only have 28 grams of nitrogen, 78 grams of um, the total mass. So therefore my closest and my highest number is going to be letter B. All right. How many atoms do I need to adjust? I think I do. How many atoms are in one mole of methanol? So, methanol, one mole of methanol contains one mole of methanol atoms. However, how many atoms are in a methanol molecule? It's one, two, three, and another three, six. So it'll be six times my number of particles, which is 6.02, times 10 to the 23rd, which gives me about 36 times 10 to the 23rd, which if I put that in proper scientific notation, should be 3.6 times 10 to the 24th. There's my answer. For every molecule of methanol, I have six atoms. So for 10 molecules, I'd have 60 atoms. And for a mole of molecules, I'd have the, the mole times six, which is 3.6 times 10 to the 24th. All right. Mass of 2.6 times 10 to the 22nd chlorine atoms. I have a number of particles. Number of particles I can convert to moles. 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, which would be 2.6 divided by 6.02 is... 0 0.432, I subtract my exponents, which would be the same thing as 4.32 times 10 to the negative second moles. Now I have to find moles to grams. What's the gram molar mass? We're talking about atoms here. 35.5 grams over one mole. What is this number? It's the same thing as 0 0.0432, so get rid of that. 0 0.0432 times 35.5 is 1.5 grams. There is your answer. Now, do I have the ability to do the last problem? Yes, I have space. Okay. Analysis of a sample of a covalent compound. So this is a molecule. Covalent means the at electrons are being shared between atoms, not an ionic compound for electron goes from one atom to another. 14% hydrogen and 85.6% carbon by mass. What is the empirical formula for the compound? If you remember these, we've got to go percentages to grams. 14.4 grams. 85.6 grams of hydrogen and carbon. Why did I get these values? Because my easiest way of going from percentage to grams is just using 100 grams. Percent is per 100. If I have 100 grams, 14.4 grams or 14.4% is going to be hydrogen. 85.6 is going to be carbon because 85.6 of 100 is 85.6. That's the easiest way to go. And then if you remember here, I'm taking this, I'm multiplying it by the molar mass to turn to moles. So 14.4 divided, divided by 1.01 equals 14.2 moles and then one mole over 12.01 grams for the case of carbon, that's the gram molar mass of carbon, 85.6 times, I'm sorry, 85.6 divided by 12.01 equals 7. Point, we'll say 7.1 moles. Divide this 
by 7.1. If you remember, we divide by the smaller number to find the ratio because empirical formula is the smallest whole number ratio of one atom to another. Smallest whole number ratio we get to by turning one of these into one. That's a one, that's a two. Our empirical formula is one carbon to two hydrogens and letter B is my answer. All right, now let me line up the last page and I will be finished with this. All right, a compound doesn't quite fit. Almost. All right, a compound contains by mass 40% carbon, 6.71% hydrogen, and 53.3% oxygen. A 0.320 mole sample of this compound weighs 28.8 grams. This is a beautiful problem. Expect something like this on the final. Even if the other teachers don't choose it, I might do this because this is so wonderful. So what do I do? Change my percentages into grams. If I have 40%, if I have a 100 gram sample and 40% is carbon, that means 40 grams are carbon. 6.71 grams are hydrogen and 53.3 grams are oxygen. So 40 grams of carbon, 6.71 grams of hydrogen and 53.3 grams of oxygen. One mole over 12, one mole over one, one mole over 16, because these are the gram molar masses. That way my grams cancel out. I'm finding a mole ratio in the molecule, which means 40 divided by 12 equals 3.33 moles of carbon. 6.71 divided by 1 equals 6.71 moles of hydrogen and then 53.3 divided by 16 is 3.33 moles of oxygen. I divide by my smallest number because I want to get a whole number ratio and I get 1 two, one. So my empirical formula, CH2O. However, I also know that a certain number of moles weighs this many grams. To find my gram molar mass, I do grams to moles. So 28.8 grams divided by 0 0.320 moles. This will give me my molar mass for this particular compound, 28.8 .8 divided by 0 0.320 is 90 grams per mole. If I add up my values here, 12 plus 16 is 28 plus 2 is 30. So my gram molar mass here is 30 grams per mole. If my actual molecular mass is 90, What's the factor between these two? It's actually three. If I multiply all of my numbers of atoms by three, I get C3H6O3. And if I added up the molar mass of this, so that's 12 times three, which is 36. 36 plus six is 42. 42 plus 16 times three is 48. Uh, so, let me do this again. 32, 36 plus 6 plus 48 is 90. That is my molar mass. This is my molecular formula, and this is my answer, letter B. All right. Now, back to balancing. We can't forget balancing. I said for stoichiometry, I would give you a balanced equation, but for the final exam, you will not have that freedom. Already I can see H3, H2. What's the common factor between them? If I have three of these and two of these, six hydrogen go in, six hydrogen come out. That's probably pretty good. Unfortunately, now I have an odd number of oxygens. If I had a two here, I have seven oxygens. That's not right. 
I'm probably going to need to double this number, which means I'm going to have to double this number and double this number. So now I have 12 hydrogens, 12 hydrogens, 4 nitrogens, 4 nitrogens, 8 oxygens plus 6 oxygens is 14 oxygens. That means I have a 7 here. My coefficient is 7. All right. Number 9 is a good old stoichiometry problem. Don't forget about stoichiometry. In this particular case, I have a balanced equation already. Now, could I double check just to be safe? Ooh. So I have one potassium, five potassium, that's six potassium. Okay, I actually am okay. Uh, one bromine, that's six bromine, there's six bromine, and six hydrogens, six hydrogens, 18 oxygens, I'm sorry, 18, no, 18 plus three is 21 oxygens, 18, yeah, 21 oxygens. I'm balanced, I'm good, okay. So, I have to make 0 0.0700 moles of bromine. What do I need to put in? Potassium bromate, if we really need to remember what that is. So, what's my mole ratio? One mole potassium bromate over, and my mole ratio, three moles of bromine. Don't forget how to work with mole ratios. Let me make sure I'm still on the screen. Ah, oh, just barely. That was a lot better. Okay. So, what is this telling me? One mole of this will make three moles of that. So, I'm canceling out the units I don't need. I'm keeping the units I'm requested which means it's 0 0.0700 divided by 3, 0 0.0233, repeating, moles of KBRO3, potassium bromate. Do I have that answer here? Yes, I do. It's letter E. All right. Last one. What mass of zinc chloride can be prepared from the reaction of 3.27 grams of zinc with 3.30 grams of HCl. This is a limiting reactant problem. Don't forget these. I guarantee you will have something like that on the final. So what do I do? I have 3.27 grams of zinc. I also have 3.30 grams of, whoops, HCl. Write those down. If I have grams, might as well change them to moles. So, the gram molar mass, let me get my periodic table. I won't put it on the screen, but my periodic table says zinc is 65.4 grams and HCl is 36.5 because chlorine is 35.5 plus 1 is 36.5. Changing my grams to moles. 3.27 divided by 65.4. 0. Point, 0 0.05 moles of zinc. And then... 3.30 divided by 36.5 is 0 0.090 moles of hydrochloric acid. Now, where do I go from here? I have a limiting reactant problem. One of these is going to run out first. If I look at my equation, one mole of this I will need two moles of that. So basically I'll need double the number of moles. I don't have double. If I multiply this by two, it's 0 .0, 0 0.1. I don't have that. 
So right now I can already tell that this is going to run out first. But if I wanted to look at it another way, how much zinc chloride could I make from this much zinc? Well, it's one mole of zinc chloride, one mole because the coefficient is not listed here, over one mole of zinc, which means moles of zinc cancel out. I could make 0 0.05 moles of zinc chloride with that much zinc. How much hydrochloric acid could I make? Well, I would need one mole of zinc chloride over two moles of HCl, which I got from my equation. My moles of HCl are going to cancel out. I end up having to divide this by two. 0.045 moles of zinc chloride are produced. Which is my lower number is my limiting reactant. That's the maximum amount of zinc chloride I can make based on what I originally put in. So 0 0.045 moles of zinc chloride times, I'm going to change this to grams. What's my gram molar mass for zinc chloride? Zinc is 65.4. Zinc chloride is ZnCl2, so that's 35.5 times 2, which is 71. My gram molar mass is 136.4 grams over 1 mole, which means 6. Point, uh, approximately 6. Point, this is the closest answer, 6.17 grams. It depends on how we rounded things off. If I did my rounding slightly different. That's the closest answer. That's the correct answer. So six point, we'll say 6.14 grams, which is very close to 6.17 grams. And that is our final answer. We are done with the review as well. Do not forget the review. For upcoming quizzes, I will actually have a lot of review questions just to make sure we don't, we don't completely forget them. The point of learning is not that we cram something on our brain and forget it as quickly as we can, it's that we actually retain this information for future use. So, there we go. See you soon.